This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. Kevin was born in Wigan in northwest England and joined the RAF as an apprentice in 1956 with only three O-levels. He came top of his course and was posted into supplies at RAF St Morgan. However, he quickly became in charge of their clothing stores and via a fortuitous route became a trainee pilot. In May 1963, he joined the RAF V-Force as a Vulcan pilot and served with 44 Squadron, where Vulcan crews were being converted to low-level flying. He describes the challenges of low-level flying, Vulcan handling and the immense power of the Vulcan's engines. He also describes his training in Canada. Kevin tells us about the different methods of nuclear bomb release, what it was like to be on the quick reaction nuclear alert, and his targets in the Soviet Union. Kevin also flew a number of the Queen's birthday flights up the Mall in London, and he describes a near collision on one of these events in cloud. We also remember his colleagues, who never came back from their missions. I'm delighted to welcome Kevin to our Cold War conversation. I'm a Wigan grammar school boy who didn't get on well at school because I was lazy. I never went to school and I had a difficult home because I, my mother was, uh, I think, somewhat resentful. So I looked for the opportunity to leave. I was brought up by my grandmother who had nine children, well, including me, she she looked after nine. She had eight children, including my mother, and then I was, I was uh, just looked after. My mother was out working in the armament factories and around, um, and uh, I got three O-levels, <laughs> uh, but I subsequently I've looked at it, and you were eligible, uh, I was, with the, with the three O-levels. Uh, to be a pilot in the RAF. The, the only uh, drawback was I was 16. You had to be 17 and a half. So on the 26th of January 1956, Kevin joined the RAF as an apprentice. This was part of a scheme created in 1920 by Lord Trenchard, who was then Chief of the Air Staff and approved by Winston Churchill. And it changed my life. I mean, it was... Well, the best things that have happened. I revised all my education in the Air Force, all the GCs I'd done and not attended. And uh, I, I just, I was a few months older than the average, and I was a good rugby player. In fact, that was one of the drawbacks of being a good rugby player because they were short of a scrum half. And I wasn't really a scrum half, but I, I could do it. And they'd lost. The courses, the previous course had left, and they were short. And they had bullying in these services, which I spent most of my life trying to stop one way or another, because I, I really despise the, the, the way that people are treated by other people for fun. But they came and t- turned all over the beds. We lived in barrack, barrack uh, huts, and the only beds still standing were mine, because I was in the rugby team. After passing his apprenticeship, Kevin is faced with some disappointment. And I was top of my course, and I was the parade, you know, captain of the school, whatever else. Badge, you know, I'll show you the pictures. And uh, I was uh, turned down as a pilot, but I was uh, offered a, a opportunity to be an RAF regiment. Uh, rock ape. A rock ape. Actually, I... <laughs> There was a word academic risk thrown in somewhere. There was an academic risk, but they'd have me as a rock ape. The nickname rock ape originates from an incident in 1952. Two RAF regiment officers serving in Aden decided to amuse themselves by going out to shoot some Hamadryas baboons, locally referred to as rock apes. In this semi-darkness, one of the officers fired at a moving object in the distance. When he reached the target, he discovered he'd shot and wounded the other officer, and when asked at a board of inquiry why he had fired at his friend, the officer replied his target had looked just like a rock ape in the half-light. The remark soon reverberated around the RAF, and it was not long before the term was in general use. 
for the rest of my life, I've never failed an exam in the RAF. I've been on courses with group captains. I've been on courses, staff college. And I've always managed to come top. So somebody somewhere was kicking me up the bum. But I went to uh, a job as a supplier. I was a, a corporal supplier one at RAF St. Morgan. And the, the senior equipment officer had been burned badly in his Lancaster my job was nailing up the Lancaster spares and sending them back. back. The RAF uh, had air quartermasters, load masters, they call them. And if you were a supplier, one, I was because I'd done a course, I was eligible to be automatically. So they made me a sergeant supplier, 19 years old. Seriously, that's... Um, resented by the adjutant of 99 Squadron, where I was based. And there we were, uh, Sergeant, 19-year-old Kevin. And that's when I got married. I was I commuted from St. Morgan to Wigan via the replenishment aircraft that brought in spares for, at the weekend on a Friday. This young equipment officer generously said, off you go, Kevin. I played rugby again at the weekend times if, if I wasn't going up there. But I went up to Shrewsbury, to uh, Shawbury, where my wife, who's not with us now, lived eight miles down the road. <laughs> and then I hitchhiked from St Morgan up the A. Murpsy Dupty to Wigan and had a, two nights at home with this lady who became my wife. The war was on in Egypt, Suez. Yeah. The 1956 Suez crisis was caused by Britain, along with France and Israel, invading Egypt to recover control of the Suez Canal. Domestically, it caused massive political fallout in Britain and resulted in an economic crisis. Internationally, it further complicated the politics of the Middle East, threatening Britain's key diplomatic relationships with Commonwealth nations and the United States-United Kingdom special relationship, as the US hadn't been given prior notice of the invasion. And they nicked everybody who was anybody, had been around and did it, and they took him away. And there was I, junior, junior technician, in charge of the clothing stores. Oh, I could tell you how to make a, a fortune. I got on very well with the, the, the tailor. <laughs> and all these aircrew who'd been in the war were retiring and bringing back their equipment and I, I i i was just quite clever at making sure they left with a smile on their face because who wants to use their old gloves who wants to use their old things and, and but the, the RAF might but i had a way of being able to get rid of that no so i i i was in charge of the clothing stores uh, the, for a, a period of this time um, because of this, uh, got the uh, Egypt war, uh, and then I say the, these two fellows, the two officers there were just so good to me. They, they took me in. I mean, <laughs> I was only nineteen, and it still was quite young, you know, to be having these stripes. I learned at the technique there was one corporal in charge there when I came, and he was walking around with a, a file under his arm, like, and I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "I'm walking around with a file under my arm." <laughs> Looking busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this quartermaster thing came up. And so I, I was uh, sent, did some training. And they said, no, we're not going to give you the training because we've got some passenger airplanes and you're going to be a steward on a passenger airplane. The, the Britannia airplane, uh, the 252 Britannia, a, a cardboard floor, you know, take anything, take your boots off almost, and uh, up and down doing training for the crews and route proving because we used to stop everywhere. <laughs> in fact, I just took a jacket off a coat hanger in my spare room yesterday. Uh, <laughs> KLM Karachi. <laughs> I don't make it up. I'll tell you, yeah. you go and have a look. That was it. The RAF uh, w just put me in an aeroplane and they said, uh, boy from Wigan, 19, and then they said, we do the course, the, the, the Hastings course, to, to convert you to the Britannia, takes place at Dishforth. And so we went to Dishforth uh, in the winter, <laughs> and it's, it was crappy. So they said, we're, well, we're off. We're going to uh, 
Idris. <laughs> Idris? I thought that was a lemonade. It, no, Idris. King Idris was in charge of uh, Libya. And we went to King Idris's airport and did the whole course out there flying across the desert. <laughs> Just uh, sitting in and I learned about duty-free booze. Well, was that the first time you'd been outside? I'd never UK? been outside Britain. So I joined 99 Squadron and flew up and down with the Britannia uh, for about nine months and sat on the navigator's desk and a very nice chap. He was the adjutant who res was resented me being a, 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 a sergeant. Uh, and then I w went through the system and went to South Cerny. And at, that's where I met my, my boss man. And I, I said, I, I, I really wanted to be a, a pilot. But he said, well, that's quite a big decision, you know. And he phoned him up. Kevin has to undergo some aptitude tests. Then the next thing I knew, they crossed off navigator and they put pilot. <laughs> yeah. So then I, I say that, and from from Piston Province, they'll go to Vampires at, at uh, Swinderby. Six months on Vampires, and I can still see if I close my eyes, my first solo going over Newark. <laughs> it's amazing what the what what's up there. And in May 1963, Kevin joins the V Force as a Vulcan pilot. And the Vulcan I went to was the 44th Squadron. The reason I went to 44th Squadron was because I was fourth in the batting order of finishing the course, from the course out of 21 people. I was number four. And they had a, two CFS and one Canberra appointment. And then the next thing was all, all of them went to V-Force aircraft. And I had the first choice. And I didn't want to go wearing, wearing a, a G-suit, uh, altitude flying, blue steel. The Blue Steel missile was a British air-launched, rocket-propelled, nuclear-armed standoff missile. Built to arm the V-bomber force, it allowed the bomber to launch a missile against its target while still outside the range of service-to-air missiles. And the 44 Squadron was starting up as a low-level squadron, so I, I'll go there. And I joined a squadron and a crew, so I didn't go through the training process. As, as a crew, I went through with as a sort of odd bod, which is not a great way to start. But I replaced a bloke who had, was being promoted to captain. So he, he was sent off to do his captain's course, and then he flew on another squadron as a captain. I only knew him briefly, but he became quite famous by crashing a Vulcan into the Black Mountains. He finished his tour. He was going to CFS, uh, uh, instructor course, but he didn't make it. So there I was, a Sprog co-pilot on 44 Squadron for two and a half years. And in that time, that's when my wife let, went home, the baby died. I obviously wasn't, uh, I remember a, a, one of my bosses, I can't remember which one, you know, is talking about, you know, they didn't use the word grief in those days. So they sent me to CFS. Flying for the V-Force wasn't Kevin's first choice. If I wanted to be a fighter pilot, I'm, I am, want to be on my own. And bloody Vulcan and, and nuclear bombs and flying once a week. And when you get good enough, when you've qualified, you don't fly anymore. You know, you've got this target of time. I didn't know that amount of knowledge. Yeah, I flew with a wing commander who now became a, an air vice marshal. And I can remember a conversation that the first time we flew, and I'm sitting in the right hand seat watching this this wing commander flying, and he, he yeah, he'd been at a desk for quite a long time, and the the instructors be, be, between us because there's only two seats at the front, and uh, he, he says, "Yeah, that's fine, but uh, you're a bit close." And he said, "From which end?" <laughs> <laughs> the group, the group captain there became. Well, he became the group captain at Waddington and then an air marshal. But shall I get my logbook just to give it? Love to see it. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to. <laughs> when you opened it twice. Yeah. yeah. There's there's not a lot of of Vulcan stuff because you do so little flying. Yeah, here we go. Vampires and vampires. 
a tiny writer I was, I can read it. Bryce was the instructor, and it, Stacey, John Stacy was the uh, wing commander. John describes the experience of flying a Vulcan. It's a, a lot of power. I never flew a Mark II Vulcan at full power. They had what uh, they were built to carry, the, the engines were built, the Olympus 301s were built to carry the Skybolt, and it never came. So when you did the checklist for the engine control, it was wire locked on. Now I know there are people who used to unlock it. It's your, you know, it's your engine, I, I, not my engine. But it was quite a, quite a thrust, but it was a heavy airplane, and we'd take off with full fuel tanks every time uh, we, we would take off, except on the display, which I did a few displays, and I did uh, some fly pass. You know, the, the Queen's birthday, I used to go on that, um, did a couple of those. But, yeah, the, the takeoff of the Vulcan, the thing is, you pitch up and you rotate, and you can pull and pull and pull and stand it on its tail. And it will just keep going up. And I did it, and we diverted from Goose Bay into one of the, well, into into the States, one of the air bases up there. They said, well, you've got to go back to Goose. We've got no fuel on, hardly. <laughs> and the cold is wet, and I took off. And I shit, did this fucking climb, and I would like, really, vertical in, yeah. for that time. And say, to about 10,000 feet. And then in, in my case, we went into the bloody cloud, didn't we? And I go, they all I get it all over. But on a different occasion, I would, that one in Barksdale, one of the pilots did the similar thing. And I, I used to be say this that I could feel the pain in my thighs from being clenched up watching him take off because they were lo- loaded down with booze and charcoal briquettes we'd buy in the be- mm. the airplane was overloaded. And he tried the same thing. And I I had pay. I thought he was going to crash. You know, I really thought it would crash. What we used to do with three-engine takeoff, well, when you were an instructor on type, you had to demonstrate the loss of an engine. So you had you know, the scramble, and there's four of you going, and, and they've got to say, well, there's a chance of one in four might lose an engine. And so you've got to keep going. And, and that's interesting to watch some of the blokes uh, trying to cope with that it because it's in, you're then out well, of balance. Well, t- totally out of balance with two times the thrust on one side, and you've got to have your leg ready to keep it in in the middle. Oh, keep your little thumb on the on the button to, for the steering. Uh, and it, it, that I think they stopped. I think they might even have stopped doing it because quite a lot of exercises in aviation were practiced and then people realized that there were more people being killed with the practice certainly asymmetric flying on the meteors for example mm. than were ever going to happen if of losing an engine yeah. but that's growing up in aviation what's it like flying at low level in a vulcan i'll tell you another little story then so i did my first trip to goose bay with wally wallbank on january the 12th 1965 and uh, so it's an early, an early experience for me. And I'm looking out, and we're flying over the sim- simulating bombing attacks in Russia. And I've always been told that these trees were quite tall, <laughs> about three feet tall. And I, I didn't know. I just saw this visual picture. And I was flying, but it's it's level. And uh, these, see, I, I've only been with them a month. And the, the navigators were very, very tolerant. I didn't put the navigators' names in because I, I, I used to put crew. I, I regret doing that. And there's a radio altimeter, and it's a red, green, and yellow, you know, traffic lights. And they were always red, and I put the thing in as unserviceable. <laughs> You've got a fault in the altimeters. They're not reading. <laughs> no. said we had no horizon for the whole of the bloody trip. But if you've got visibility, as in Canada, in when the clear weather, you know you can see forever. Uh, not that there's a lot to see, uh, but it's a challenge. They do it up these late the Lake District, and I was also a TFR training officer. There's a, something else to put a badge on. Do you know what that sounds about? No, you don't. 
TFR, terrain following radar trainer. So he had to sit there while some bloke practised. Because there's inertia in, and the airplane has got a lot of inertia and it's not as responsive. I, mean, I think it, a magnificent machine for its uh, era. <laughs> it, could do it. But, uh, it wasn't my idea of, of fun doing TFR at night and there's no point in doing it in the daylight if you can see and if you can't see you shouldn't be there because that's what people do and and more than one they lost a few of these uh, aeroplanes Kevin describes the bomb release methods at least three methods when I started them they did this uh, pop up um, they used to but before that it was at high altitude before uh, they would do an, an S turn um, and it had a name and you'd pull one there and then the other way and then they'd let it go and it would throw it away and you'd be zooming off but for the low level one you had to it had to have 10,000 feet for the release of the, the weapon. So you come along, woozing along, and then up, and then a wing over and away. But by the time I, I was back on the Mark II Vulcan, it was a lay-down parachute job, and it weighed a 1,000 pounds. It was a 1,000 pounder. I couldn't believe it, because the first bomb that I saw, Red Sun, was like a, it was a 10-ton uh, World War II bomb with just the nuclear end stuck in and it you know fell out of the Lancaster or whatever but this how it started the YS2 yellow sun and then it became this thing I don't but they gave it a name and but the more interesting ones were the, when you were at 40,000 feet and you were doing these S turns because you're right on the edge uh, especially if you've got a long trip to come uh, the lay down, you just zoom through. Uh, you were never going to get away. That's what this wing commander, uh, AEO, uh, a would say. That he's, you're flying down there. It's a one way trip. I'm not coming home. So don't worry about me. Uh, was, so uh, is, is what he's saying there, you wouldn't have escaped the blast? At, at you, you, I don't. Well, the people doubt. I mean, the, yeah. we don't know the, 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 the strength of the, those particular weapons. They had this multiple time of the Hiroshima bomb. Kevin describes QRA, or Quick Reaction Alerts. This is a 24 hours a day, seven days a week state of alert with crews ready to launch a nuclear mission at any time. QRA starts at 15 minutes. So you're in, you're, you're near, but you're 15 minutes. You're to be in the cockpit with the engines. Right. Right. So... You get the bomber controller, and he calls you. This is the bomber controller for such force only. Uh, readiness one five, and off you go. At one five, you get in the cockpit, and then they bring you up to. And and you can take off. I've I've taken off on it, and then you end up somewhere too, like one of the dispersal airfields, because that's the the whole point of the. Get get them off the ground so they're not all in one big hump. Yeah, fifteen minutes. You were from in the aeroplane. Fifteen minutes. Uh, I was. Yeah. Otherwise, you were. And then, if you yeah, get like, the call to go, yeah, you assume it's an exercise. I think everybody and, did yes. until you get the radio <laughs> message to say. Yeah, I think everybody assumed not. it. How was the command given for you to release the nuclear bomb? Well, the th that was uh, done with codes through your, uh, head command headquarters, right? And there were two lock. You you compared you you open your safe on board even, and if the numbers apply, then somebody's got to press a button. And you drilled it every time you flew. You 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 had it really to checked the bomb release safety lock, and then off it would go. Uh, I don't think anyone ever thought, in my experience, yeah. that they'd, they'd ever have to s set one off. So the bomb release lock, that's controlled by the, the captain. captain? Yeah, he's got right. that. Yeah, and then right. do you pass control to the nav radar? No, the or... nav radar finds the target and yeah. he then presses his release. But you've got to... Uh, uh, Un release the release to him. Yeah, to release, right. yeah. Okay. It's okay. bomb release safety. And is that, uh, that's yeah. like a verbal you say, right, yeah. you now have control. Yeah, that's right. Is yeah. there a yeah. certain form of words that you would say to the nav yeah. radar? 
Yep, that's 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 it. Uh, but to say is it, that is one of the memories of, of, of no no real thought of that, but we we do all these drills and you're on QRA yep. and was there any time where you were scrambled and you didn't know whether it was a test or whether it yep. was you just hoped it wasn't you know you uh, the one of the real reasons I was not in my bed for more than half the year was that we had so many bosses. You had the group captain uh, who'd run the station and have a, a, a station exercise. And there were a, a, a thing called the Tacky Val, and that would go by, by group headquarters. And then we got included into the maritime elements because they used the nuclear. We used to go for ships. And so we had so many bloody bosses and they could each pull one of their things it was a pain in the ass, you know. You never knew a what was happening, so it, you would assume that it was a, a drill because. But it, but it could have been. It could have been for real, for real yeah. Until yeah. you got a well, recall. until you got your your, your code, it, it it was fairly safe. I thought you were going to ask about if you got stood down. Uh, I've, I've had people refusing to get out because they haven't received the stand down. Code, <laughs> and they think it's me. No, I don't. And they, they're there with an, an aeroplane ticking away, and they they won't take any notice of the instruction because it's not been to the letter. So, just yeah. I just yeah. want to just yeah. understand yeah. how that yeah. how that QRA scramble works. Yeah. So, you are told go. Yes. And when you're airborne, are you sent a message to say keep going or yeah? Return. But before you went, you yeah. would know where you were going, right? Because you would be ta- uh, each week. You had a requirement for target study. I think I've read. I've read someone I've left the air force and didn't want to do it because he met a girl somewhere, you know, in a foreign land where he was. And when they were chatting, he said uh, she she was in the town where he was his was his target. I mean, I I just didn't. I know a lot of Russian places because <laughs> that's all we had, and there were places where you would go to land, and you would that would be. I mean, you knew you couldn't come back to Waddington because mm. you ain't got any fuel. There's no refueling on the way, and uh, the, so it, that's why it was a one way thing. But we, as I say, as a combat survival officer, we would have our boots that we could walk, <laughs> turn into shoes, and we'd hide behind bushes. I don't know. What were your targets? What, what cities were they? They were very, very mainly, uh, they, they were military or uh, factories. You didn't know sometimes because you just got a route into a town or a, an area. Because although we used to have bombing competitions where they could, sh- I mean, the bombing uh, accuracies were amazingly from 40,000 feet. On these competitions, and they'd get them, you know, with bullseye. But it didn't matter. It, it did not matter what what uh, the, the the low level delivery was. Definitely the the, the best way out, in, in my my opinion, because there is a protection from the ground. Well, there was anyway, yeah. uh, if you were doing it. Yeah. And yeah. can you remember any of the cities? Or no, I well, I could, you know, John. I have not committed any. And it, no, my memory just isn't good enough. Yeah. We tended to use uh, what's the word? Uh, the, use it as a a rest hour or two. You go into sign into the the, the centre because you had to sign for all your documents and carry them in there, and no one else was allowed in there. So you could play cards if you wanted to, and I'm sure people did. Uh, but you know, I, I've been a, a meticulously. I do what I have to do, mm. uh, but you can get feel that it's a bit pointless. This because I ain't ever going to do this. I, if I looked at a map, I, you know, I could pick a name, but I say, well, I know that because that's that river up there, and uh, there were and the whole load of well, the navigators themselves, and the, you had two navigators, the, the bomber, but. They're equally trained, and he would tell you what you're doing. Then that's your place. Map. You might have to map read. 
Khaki, yeah, that's a long time ago. That. Did you yeah. discuss with the crew what you were going to do after the bomb was released? Like yeah. where you were going to go? Well, no, you had a route. Oh, yeah, yeah. You a- after. So you did yes. you have a route... Yeah, after, after oh you yeah, released the bomb. M- m- that's that's one of the thing. That mostly the the well, I should think entirely. Your subsequent destination after you drop the bomb yeah. would be somewhere in Turkey, probably if you're going into to Russia. Okay. Um, uh, but it would be specified in your routing. Okay, uh, and off you'd go. Uh, so I know a lot of places in you know of names in t- Turkey because with. Britannia never went to Turkey when I was with working for them, and then they started right at, right at the end of my time. They started having holidays in very in these places, and I thought, oh, I've heard of that. Where's that? And it was was one of the re- recovery airports. Yeah. So I hope they're friendly. Yeah. And if it's a one way ticket, you may well choose not to go to an airfield. You may well s- slide it down on the mm. on, on a lake. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think anybody has ever. Has anyone ditched one of these things? I'm not sure. Well, but only he, in the yeah, Thunderball, it, the James Bond oh, that, film. Yeah. Have you ever watched that? Yeah. Well, the thing is that I talked about this the other day because I'm clearing stuff out there that's full of films of various sorts. And one, uh, and while I did, uh, I would watch the film, and it was Thunderball bon, came up, and the chap standing at the bottom of the ladder. Is an old maid of mine, and I can't think of his name. We were we were really good friends, and the question I was asking was: every time anybody watches one, well, does he get a, does he get a loyalty? Because <laughs> he just pain. stands at the bottom. Yeah. The pilot was Albert Wallace, who is the guy who I flew with here. He did the flying over the sea, and then there's a. I think I'm. I, I, I got a photograph of me standing at the. Oh, you don't want to see a photograph of me standing at the bottom of the ladder of, of a Vulcan. It's just a, just not a very. The, the they send them photographs off for a, pr- a promotional uh, advertising for the, and it was uh, the Queen's birthday day because the dates on the back second of some, of June. So these fly pass the Queen's fly pass. There'd be probably six or seven rehearsals. And one year, they gave the job to the pilots of the instructors at, uh, from Finningley, the, the OCU. But the year before and the year after that, they gave it to my squad, was got I was on. And uh, <laughs> so, so you yeah, have to believe this, but the, the, the briefing was being given in, in Waddington. And Eric asked a question. <laughs> what will you do if you get uh, IMC? That's a simple question. I certainly would have, it was a good question. And this bloke, squadron leader, said, uh, well, we'll deal with that. And he bloody didn't, because on the day we actually went, on that day we went into cloud. And I'm the f- number four. So IMC is? In cloud, India, right. my okay. instrument meteorological conditions, sorry. Right, okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm at the back, and there are four Vulcans, and then they hang the uh, lightnings or whatever else is hanging on them, but the, the, bit, the backbone of these four aeroplanes. And this boss went into the cloud and so he had to dive below it uh, because we can't see, you can't see mm-hmm. it. But he, to get down, he put the air brakes out and the air brakes of the Vulcan, it, it, it's just one big, big fence. Mm-hmm. Just come chunk. And what happens then? He says, the plane slows up. <laughs> well, if you do that without telling anybody. Yeah, the one behind. There's, there's two behind in this case. And I came out the bottom and there's me. And I was within, you know, I don't say inches, but because your, your separation is quite long normally, anyway. And if you've got any sense, as I, I commend, you, you would take, if you see you're coming up to cloud, you're not going to be just plowing on or get a bit closer than I can keep behind him, not at all. And uh, it was Friday. It's so bad that that night I was in bed and he phoned me up. <laughs> well, because we we didn't meet it after the flight because they went he went back to Scampton where he was based and I went back to Waddington. 
But they had done this, the, the intermediate year, they'd done this with the full lot, and they flew up Oxford Street instead of the mall. <laughs> yeah, they were funny old times. People are becoming more interested in the Cold War, and Michael, my son, said, uh, the Vulcan particularly, because it had that uh, bit of a show-off at the Falklands. Did you ever talk with your crew or with other people about the implications of releasing a nuclear weapon yeah. and what that yeah what the oh yeah was. yeah yeah i think everyone was very open about it and no one no one believed they would actually do it but if it was necessary they would because that's how they they they're training them but they there was no fear that there would be some miscarriage of uh, sending the wrong a code. A mistake right? or something. Not a mistake. Before it, you it, were put on Vulcan, yes. did they ask you about your views on nuclear weapons yeah, or they, anything like that? I'm sure like they that? did, yeah. You get, before you go in the, the nuclear area, why are all pilots officers? And it's because you handle nuclear comfort, uh, mm-hmm. secret and to be... Handling that material, you've got to be. So you go through the from right to the outset, and we know it's not foolproof, is it? Mm. I can still see the sign, the, the newspaper leaderboards outside the uh, paper shop in Wigan mm. High Street when I was about twelve, when the McLean and his Burgess. Burgess had legged it, and I've been that interested in protecting us mm. by the best means possible. And certainly, I think, without a doubt, all the people who were flying with nuclear weapons knew that it's, as the deterrent, it's what it is. And the people who malign it or criticise it are undermining the effect of it. And if you were given the order to drop it, there's no doubt. That's right. It would just, I think, I I say, in my opinion, from that time, there was no one would say it, no, and uh, they didn't dare say anything like that. <laughs> no, I every I don't think it's ever ever any criticism yeah. from the air crew that I know, yeah. and that, but I don't think there were many gung ho, you know, boys. Not like fighter pilots who really do break the rules because it's only them that they're bothering. Whereas mm-hmm. crew of five, big responsibility to each other. In the the Vulcan. It's only the pilot and the co-pilot that have ejector yeah, seats. Yeah. That's right. No, because I was brought home in Malta because the guy was just below and slow, hit the ground and it bounced, and the the, the uh, rover set the fuel on fire, and yeah. so the airplane was burning downwind, and they they banged out how they, you know fully serviceable airplane. And they killed six people or whatever it was. And I don't know if it was on the ground. I was quite young at the time, but I know uh, descent and loss of lift. And I used to take them to 8,000 feet over Flamborough Head, clear day, and i say, do a practice uh, approach and put the, the air brake out. <laughs> And see, you would be the rate of descent a thousand feet a minute, and that's a big an approach. And just keep holding that. And suddenly, I mean, plump, you're doing 4,000 feet a minute in no time at all. And that's what happened in Malta. You can, you sympathize because they didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> just, uh, on so the other was, hand, this just, was the incident yeah. at Valletta where they came down too quickly. Wrecked the undercarriage. Yeah, took a plane. It went off. off. It went. They went, went around. Off, off That's again, right. By which time the aircraft had, it was on. It was on fire. Fire. Yeah. Did the pilot and co-pilot get out of that? Yeah. yeah. And so the three, the both pilots flying and flew on Vulcans again later on. Right. Did no, you? Yeah. Did you fly yeah. any of the other V bombers? No, not at all. Uh, no, and of course a lot of my mates did, but the. The Valiant never lasted long enough. It it crashed in market raisin, and that was the end of it. it they threw it away, and uh, the, <laughs> the 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 other one, the Victor, became a tanker. Did you do any escape and evasion training? 
You mean uh, uh, not like what if you were shot down? What what? Yeah, well, that, down? That, yeah. Oh, I I was I was a trainer of the mm. combat rescue and survival officer did this, and we go on the Dartmoor for three or four days, and uh, at limited amount of support. Um, we also did ding you know into the ocean and do things. Yeah, a lot of good training there. So, oh, uh, yeah, so the interrogation is one. And that's one that I was afeard of. So the, when I did the actual course at, at uh, Mount Batten, it's on Dartmoor in April, and we were out for a couple of nights, and the weather was absolutely, and we were, we, uh, and we were lost. No, no, no doubt about it. Uh, and uh, I found, I saw a glimmer of light, and I headed for it with the, I had the whole, some of them was together. And there were a Boy Scouts cooking <laughs> cook the evening meal in a, in a sort of, like a cave yeah. almost. Wow. Well, we stayed there the night. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> and we actually, the, the staff was so upset, because I suppose we're quite a valuable commodity. And if you, yeah. you know, I mean, Dartmoor on a winter, well, April yeah. night even, heavy rain. And I thought, if you're going to get pneumonia, for training, you know, <laughs> stop. We don't need to bother. And we got people who did do uh, this overkill, like a boxer would want to knock you out, whereas you're only boxing. And I, I, I was always a bit mod modest on my leading because <laughs> I'm not lazy. I was a very fit, uh, and I, I enjoyed doing survival training. That's why I became a survival and training. The, the, the qualifications I got. I, some of these books, when I looked them up the other day. Um, I got things that are just just a certificate of competence, in Waddington, to an airframe. I can do the seats. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed how neat my writing was there. <laughs> so you did the uh, yeah. bombing competitions in the US. We well. they did. That's the the one that I attended and uh, at Barksdale. Yeah, but they go on the different places. But th this was SAC mm. B fifty twos, and there's really no competition. The accuracy of the B fifty two, but they the RAF squadrons have done well, really well. Yeah, but it was a social, not a social than anything else, <laughs> like a lot of things. But the kids used to say to me, "We do the war, Dad," and I said, "I kept the peace." So I helped. I always put that help to keep the peace. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.